Okay, make sure this works. Um, my name is Arlene Nelson. I have a master's degree in nursing. And seven years ago, my body absolutely broke. Before that, I had tried every diet and just kept getting fatter. And I discovered the Health at Every Size movement and stopped dieting and tried to make peace with my life. But I couldn't get, let go of the idea that obesity is a disease process. I relentlessly read through health books, blogs, documentaries, until I decided no one really had the answer. Everyone seemed to have a piece of the puzzle, but not enough to put the whole puzzle together. So I gave up, and I binged on Netflix for a year. And I was more fatigued and still slowly gaining weight. My doctor found I had markers in my blood for systemic autoimmune disease. Of course, I immediately made a follow-up appointment with Dr. Google. It's uh, usually pointless, I know, but this day I stumbled across an obscure patient blog that flipped my world completely upside down. And that's what led me to this presentation called the Viking Winter Diet. And it's called Treating Auto Obesity and Autoimmune Diseases Through Vitamin A Elimination. Oops. So I have nothing to disclose. Um, the learning objectives are explain why dieting uh, can contribute to and increase obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular, autoimmune disease long term. Identify a correlation between vitamin A supplementation and the, ri the rise of these diseases. Um, recognize um, symptoms of vitamin A toxicity and how they correlate with a lot of symptoms of obesity, uh, fat disorders in general and explain the significance of eating seasonally and how that reduced our intake of vitamin A before the Industrial Revolution, and describe how to implement an A-free diet to combat these diseases. So uh, along my journey, I made a um, kind of a dream treatment. What do I want in, uh, to treat my fat disorder? And I felt like I was wandering around in the wilderness looking for a unicorn, something that didn't exist. I didn't want to calorie restrict. I didn't want to carbohydrate restrict. I didn't want any costly out-of-pocket surgeries. I didn't want to take any medications. I always get polypharmacy things going on or side effects. And, and then it, I wanted it to conform with my religious beliefs. So it's basically a biblical thing about that uh, grain is the staff of life. Um, and along the way, I had several pivot points and one of them was coming across a lecture by Dr. Diana Schwartzbein. And her lecture she put out in 2014, and I'm waiting for the book. I keep checking Amazon, but she hasn't put it out. But it's called um, uh, Survival of the Smartest. And this is what I learned from that. Uh, she said that metabolism is the sum total of all your biochemistry. And there are all kinds of building reactions and using reactions. And you can only be using or building at any given moment. And you can't do both at the same time. She says, anytime you are uh, using more than you're building, you are breaking down. And that's what aging is. We lose our ability to build as fast as we break down. So you actually are accelerating your aging when you are in the using side of your metabolism. And that really starts to kick in for women around 35 and men around 40. And the deception is that it feels really good to break down because of your body's compensatory mechanisms to keep you alive. It feels good until you are broken. And diets plateau or you start to feel bad, your body then has to start compensating for breaking down. And physical states like low blood sugar, hypoglycemia, or for example, are incompatible with life. So your body compensates in the opposite direction, causing hyperglycemia because that is compatible with life. And she says that chronic disease is your body keeping you alive. So if you have a chronic disease, thank your body because it's kept you alive. We have um, also using hormones and building hormones. Our major users are adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol. Our major builder is insulin. Insulin is actually our youth hormone. We want to be um, using insulin and keeping that high and keeping it in to our cells. We have another thing that governs our metabolism, and it's our involuntary nervous system, system our autonomic nervous system. We have a sympathetic side, the fight or flight side, the stress side, and we have a parasympathetic side, the rest and digest or feed and breathe side. 
and you can only, um, the only access you have to going from the, the stress side to the, the uh, rest side is through your breathing, doing a lot of those deep breathing exercises. So on the using side, when you calorie or carbohydrate restrict, you place your body in the using side of your metabolism. You raise all of the using hormones of adrenaline, noradrenaline, and cortisol, and lower the building hormone of insulin. And she states that in 2007, a study group, the Muniapa et al., showed a, an important part of our metabolism and how insulin is metabolized and used. It, she said that um, the section of our metabolism called the P13K pathway of insulin, when that gets damaged in our cells, our body stops producing nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a very potent vasodilator, so it lowers your blood pressure, keeps your blood pressure nice and low. It is also the most important substance your body makes to keep you from having heart attacks and strokes. This is, in essence, why metabolic syndrome causes cardiovascular disease. And you can also do this to yourself by going on low-carb or low-calorie diets or over-exercising. So when you're stuck in the stress side of your metabolism, um, your, you can get diseases like PTSD, anxiety disorders, tachycardia, insomnia, autoimmune diseases. And another thing that kind of guided my um, decision to stop dieting was, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> the um, Minnesota starvation experiment. This was done in World War II to just try to help the um, survivors of famine, and it was, they took, as of keys, took 36 men, they were normal, they were eating about 3,200 calories a day. During the study, they gave them 15, about 1,500 calories a day. Oops. So these are the, uh, some of the effects of starvation, weight loss, fatigue, decreased endurance, weakness, insomnia, constipation, edema, shrinkage of organs, food obsessions, lowered heart rates, um, cold intolerance, brain fog, decreased cognitive abilities, um, immune deficiencies, hair loss, tinnitus, numbing, tingling, bizarre eating rituals, body dysmorphia. And this was all before the dieting movement had started and there was any um, you know, pressure to cut back or restrict. But it sounds a lot like all the things that we may have experienced dieting. So I decided that never again would I do that to my body. And the men, when they went through a recovery period, they, um, Ansel Keys says, in, a, in an adult man, no appreciable rehabilitation can take place on a diet of 2,000 calories a day. The proper level is more like 4,000 for some months. But this is kind of an understatement because a lot of the men would binge up to 11,000 calories a day in the recovery period. And they also, when they recovered, when their bodies recovered, they gained an extra 10% in body fat. So, I'm eight minutes into my presentation and I've overturned the apple card on the conventional wisdom regarding fat loss. And when I started reading the vitamin A elimination blog, it was initially with an interest in autoimmune disease. I thought the author might be onto something, it didn't seem dangerous, and I thought I would just try it out and cut back a bit. What followed over the next few weeks, I called the best of times and the worst of times. Uh, I felt amazing the first week. My brain changed, my vision went from analog to a vibrant HD, I started losing weight. Then my immune system went haywire, and I randomly felt jolts of adrenaline, like I'd been shot with an EpiPen. And I monitored more, monitored more closely when this had happened, and it all followed about 15 minutes after I'd eaten something that had vitamin A. It felt so awful to have these attacks that I went fanatically strict on cutting out A. I didn't know how long I would be stuck on the A-free train. I just knew I couldn't live with the adrenaline attacks and irritability anymore. And over the next few weeks, completely A-free, the transformation of my health was undeniably amazing. Asthma improved, acid reflux disappeared, insomnia improved, IBS improved, along with a noticeable decrease in histamine reactions with lymph flow. Brain fog vanished, along with fatigue, and I felt like I got my life back. 
I didn't calorie or carb restrict. I ate about 3,000 calories a day, and the weight gain, or, or the weight just effortlessly trickled off. I didn't change anything else in my life. I didn't exercise. I wanted to make sure weight loss couldn't be attributed to any other factors. And now to date, I've lost 25 pounds. <laughs> So this is what I learned from this man, his blog, um, Grant Janero. He said that vitamin A in America in the 1970s, the government mandated that vitamin A be added to low-fat dairy, cereals, and bread flours, a lot of places where it had never been. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin, and the, that builds up over time and can become toxic. Think of the drug isotretinoin. It's massively high doses of retinoid or vitamin A, and it's given to teens to treat cystic acne. And it is a very dangerous teratogen for pregnancy. Here's some of the serious side effects of this drug. A lot of depression, thoughts of suicide, depressed mood, sleep problems, changes in weight, muscle weakness, severe diarrhea, um, jaundice, so it's really hard on your liver. And I, as I went through this, I realized that if vitamin D was the antidepressant vitamin, vitamin A was the depressant vitamin. So, eating the standard American diet, should we be asking ourselves if we are also having similar symptoms on a slower daily buildup of excess vitamin A? Because it's a fat-soluble vitamin and it doesn't, we can't just urinate it away with our, our getting rid of water. So, these are, here's from the NIH, other symptoms of chronic vitamin A toxicity. The ones in yellow are the ones that I ex experience, like really strange dry skin patches, and, um, and a lot of it sounds kind of like fibromyalgia stuff. So, here are a few um, studies that inadvertently showed adding what vitamin A can do to weight. So in a psych ward, they, a, in the 50s to the 60s, a, one of the doctors noticed that the, that the patients had low levels of vitamin A. So he said, special attention has been given to the provision of liberal supplies of vegetables. However, the use of tranquilizing drugs has improved the appetites of the patients to such an extent that obesity has become a common problem. And I wish I could ask him, so why did tranquilizing drugs not cause weight gain in the patients before adding the vegetables? And an epileptic study um, was done when they took away vitamin A, and um, this is what was done with the, the patients. They kept the calories high. For the first three and a half months, they all gained a little bit of weight. But the following two and a half months, all 10 people sim simultaneously lost amazingly large amounts of weight. Two people lost 10 kilograms, 22 pounds, of their maximal weights. They're not very big people either. And the author interprets the weight loss to be a consequence of the exhaustion of the subject's vitamin A reserves and compares it to the weight loss observable in vitamin A deficient rats. So we, this begs the question, does this salad make me look fat? I think this is a question that no dietitian would ever ask in the United States. But maybe we need to be radical and start asking. Um, so I called this the Viking winter diet because as I was eating an A-free diet, I happened to turn on a PBS documentary on the, on the Vikings. And since I'm like a Viking, you know, I'm as far north as my genes are as you can get, I was watching it and watching along and, and I realized, I'm like, they're eating the stuff that I am eating right now. And, um, and I thought about the seasons of, you know, how long would it have been winter and would they been, have been able to get a lot of foods that had vitamin A for most of the year? And, and the answer is no. And I, and I pretty much, you know, when my friends at work would tease me about uh, what I was eating at work, I'd be like, hey, I'm taking a nutritional winter. I'm on the Viking winter diet. I wanted to sound cool, <laughs> but I just made it up. So. And um, so I looked into the medieval cuisines. People, for the most part, ate grains. And um, 
people that they weren't able, never in history has anyone been able to bring anything they wanted from anywhere in the world to a certain place to eat it all year long like we have now. We have completely um, gone off of that concept of eating seasonally. And um, one of the best parts about grains and starches is the fact that they can be made resistant starches. And resistant starches are starches that your small intestine can't digest. They get to your large intestine. Your good bacteria then digest the starches. And they make out of that starch that you couldn't digest a short chain saturated fat. They're making a fat that your body needs. And one of the main fats is butyrate. And what does butyrate do? Um, butyrate is the preferred fuel of your colon lining. It can cause colon cancer cells to self-destruct versus replicate. Plays a large role in improving the gut barrier integrity, so or helping you with leaky gut. And poor gut barrier function is linked to many diseases, including fatty liver, heart failure, autoimmune disease. And a starch can be made more resistant by cooking it and cooling it overnight. So think like potato salad. So a mice study that was done about resistant starch, they um, took a group of mice and um, fed them a high-fat diet, and they became obese and profoundly insulin resistant. And we heard yesterday that we don't want to be insulin resistant. That's not, we don't want to have metabolic syndrome. That's not where we want to be. So a portion of the mice that were fed the resistant starches experienced these uh, improvements. They decreased, well, the mice that were fed the, the, the resistant starch had these things happen. So they decreased their cholesterol by 25%. They decreased their triglycerides by 50%. And I, when I made special attention to make sure I was getting resistant starches, was able to lower my triglycerides by 50, only to have them pop back up when I stopped. Um, making sure that I got a resistant starch every day. And um, they increased their insulin sensitivity by 300%, and that is huge because that's where you want to be. And they raised their metabolism significantly, and they dropped their calorie consumption even spontaneously by 20% in 10 weeks. So, A-free foods, otherwise known as 50 shades of beige. <laughs> Look at that sexy beige kitty. So, it's all boring stuff. It really is. Um, I do overnight oats, uh, cream of wheat, cream, you know, rice, um, atri pastas, gnocchis, um, artisan breads, cauliflower, mushrooms, things like that. It's all boring stuff, and you can, um, but it's for a purpose. Um, I found that you can, you can get A-free milks. Um, there are only three brands that I've been able to find that don't have it. And, um, vegan cheeses, things like that. And so you can do some meats. And um, you only really want to spice things with salt and pepper in the beginning because a lot of the spices have similar traits to vitamin A or have vitamin A in them. And strawberries actually are a fruit that are very, very low in A. Um, blueberries, not so much. Egg whites, not egg yolks. One egg yolk is 10% of your RDA of vitamin A. So consideration, so start slowly and build up. It can take about a month before you um, have enough uh, resistant starch and butyrate to make a difference. Um, you can use a nut nutrient tracking app to look up foods before you eat them. And also, um, you won't need to do this forever. It's not a lifestyle change. And even when I you know, went through the holidays, I even lost a couple pounds going through the holidays and didn't gain any weight even when I had gotten a little bit of vitamin A. But it, of course at that point I had gone past that uh, my immune system had calmed down enough that I, because I had taken out enough A that it wasn't still going crazy. So here is my contact information. And I want to thank you for listening and for um, having this conference. Thank you.